Tick tock, time to rock. Hey, check this out. <laughs> first, first uh, it, it, it gives me a burst of comments right when I turn it on. Um, but we have here, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Support good and righteousness. David Wood is not only mocking Prophet Muhammad, but he is mocking all the messengers of Allah, Noah, Ibrahim, Moses, David, including Jesus, or Isa, Ibn Maryam. David Wood is lying to you. Anyone recall me mocking Abraham, Moses, David, and so on? Nope, I mock Muhammad. Why? Because he is the most obvious false prophet in history, ladies and gentlemen. This is a guy who actually convinces his followers that the greatest thing they can do in life is go slaughter a bunch of people and die in the process. All right? If anyone in history, if anyone in history is worthy of mockery, it's Muhammad. All right? This is the guy who uh, has to, who's so obsessed with controlling the behavior of his followers that he he literally has to tell them how to go to the bathroom. Number one and number two, how to step into the bathroom. Uh, how to wipe themselves properly. And, and guys, it's not like, it's not like, oh, here's some great, great hygienic practice that Muhammad introduced. No, it's things like you have to wipe yourself with an odd number of stones. You have to pee while squatting. And I, I've seen people try to defend, oh, you know, I, well, I sit down on the toilet because it's more clean. He doesn't say sit down on a toilet. He says squat while peeing, right? Squat, squat on the ground. The, 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 surrounding, the surrounding people said he pees like a girl. And uh, I mean, that is not that is not a more hygienic way to urinate if you're a guy. If you're a guy, you can actually pee a few feet away from you. And so you're not messing around getting it all over your shoes and stuff. If you're squatting to pee and you're a guy, you're getting it all over the place, all around your feet and so on. Very, very strange, strange practice. Muhammad uh, ordered his followers to to lick their uh, to lick their own fingers and their, and other people's fingers after eating. Right. And he said that it's because you don't want Allah has hidden a blessing in some particle of the food, and you don't want Satan to get the blessing. So uh, if if Anthony here is sitting there eating Cheetos, then according to Muhammad, I'm supposed to suck his fingers afterwards because I need to get that blessing. This is disgusting stuff, right? Um, you've got the the drinking camel urine. You've got the uh, uh, all all of the the, the stuff that would that would actually get you killed if you followed. Hey, if you eat seven Ajwa dates. Then you're immune to all forms of poison all day. This is this comes from a guy who died by poisoning. Muhammad. Muhammad died from being poisoned by a Jewish woman. Those Ajwa date, those Ajwa dates didn't work very well, right? And again, all of this comes from a guy who convinced his followers that the greatest thing they can do in life is go die while slaughtering other people. And we see the we see the fruits of this all around us. So again, if anyone in history, if anyone in history is worthy of mockery, it's Muhammad. Just so you know. All right. So anyway, I clicked on the first comment that I saw when we started. Anthony, how are things going? Uh, they're going good. Let me throw in something here. Are you shocked? Just make sure you don't mock Muhammad in the process, because I, for one, will not tolerate any mockery of Muhammad. Because as everyone knows, to mock Muhammad is to mock all of God's messengers. <laughs> That's what I want to chime in on. Okay. Muslims are under the strange idea that they believe in all the prophets. And yet the only way they're able to come to that conclusion is by accepting the word of Muhammad to the denial of what all the prophets said, right? The only way you can say you're believing all the prophets as a Muslim is if you actually reject what all the prophets taught. Or if you reduce what all the prophets taught to simply what Muhammad taught. So in other words, when you say as a Muslim, I believe what Abraham taught, all, what you really mean is, I believe what Muhammad said, Abraham said. Mm -hmm. Or I believe what Muhammad said, Noah said. I believe what Muhammad said, David said, Jesus said, and so forth. So really, at the end of the day, Muslims don't, it's just like, it's the same thing as when they say we believe in all the books, right? They don't really believe in all the books. They believe in the Quran, and whatever the Quran says, the books say. And and really, you can create any religion and uh, set it up if, if that's you know if that's your method, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you adopt that method and accept it as legitimate, 
then anybody can come along later and say, I'm a Muslim, I believe in Muhammad, I honor Muhammad better than all of you people do because I believe what he taught and follow what he taught. And when you point to what he taught, you just say, no, he taught what I taught. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, 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 so we could say we're prophets and we're, we're God's final prophets and Muhammad agreed with us. And you, and you Muslims say, what? No, Muhammad said he's the seal of the prophets. We said, no, no, no. That part was corrupted by his followers. What Muhammad really said was when David and Anthony come along, you better believe in him or you're going to hell. That's what Muhammad really said. And if you disagree with him, then you're a horrible person. And guess what? Uh, all the prophets said, hey, David and Anthony are coming. Well, why don't we find those records of that? Because the records have all been corrupted. But they said it. They said it, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't see how we'd be any uh, doing anything different from what Muhammad did. Now, did you tell people well, you were eating pizza? Because this guy seems to know it. <laughs> did you tell someone? No, I didn't. You didn't? Tell oh, him. he was he was right. Hey, <laughs> hey, throw away. That was a good get. That was literally what we were just downstairs doing. <laughs> we were down there eating pizza. <laughs> And yes, apologetics don't take a lot of energy. I was thinking maybe it's on our mouths or... Yeah, yeah so, uh, wow. Spot on, spot on. Um, a uh, shake three time here. He got a little rhyming action going. When they drop the mic, smash that like. <laughs> Vocab would be like, oh, that's the coolest thing I ever saw in my whole life. <laughs> oh, man. What is this? <laughs> Louise said, uh, Louise said uh, smash that underage like button. I guess because Muhammad liked underage. See, I could have tossed that in there, right? I was being gentle with all the weird stuff about Muhammad, right? Uh-oh. <laughs> we're, we're starting already, Anthony. What? The Trinity was made up at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Wow. Uh, I, I, guys, I, I really do have trouble distinguishing the trolls who are pretending to be as dumb as possible and saying the the dumbest things imaginable and people who actually say really, really stupid things. Because guess what? There are people, plenty of them, who say really, really stupid things. And so you can't be shocked when someone says something really, really stupid. Um, but at the same time, there are trolls who, they're, they're kind of, they're kind of friendly trolls, right? They want you to answer a stupid objection because they've got a friend who says it and they so they want to hear the answer. So they'll go ahead and post it. The Trinity was made up, up at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. So they'll post stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so we don't know. Uh, we don't know where Metal Warrior Apologist is real quick. Metal Warrior, why don't you let us know? Hey, is, da is David back in here complaining? D David, the tr I don't mean me, David. I mean, David, the troll. Dude, you... Can't do it, man. No time for this. Just so you know, guys, we are uh, we are here recording videos. We're here recording a series on the Trinity in the Old Testament. So we're just going live just because we're here. And uh, it's a good break from the other stuff we're doing on, uh, putting together uh, scripts and so on. Um, so no time for trolls right now. Guys, if you're just trolling and I find out you're trolling, and I'm probably just going uh, to block you off here so we can actually get to some more interesting topics. Um... So, Metal Warrior, by the way, Anthony, is it true that the Trinity was made up at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD? <sighs> Absolutely not. Uh, you know what I think a lot of people misunderstand in terms of the history of the discussion of the doctrine of the Trinity is, is the, the role that the creeds played. The, uh, for example, it's uh, at Constantinople in 381, the church affirmed what was stated earlier at Nicaea, and added the statement to, about the Spirit that he is worshipped together with the Father and the Son. So some people would say, oh, so at, at the Council of Constantinople, all of a sudden the church is now worshipping the Holy Spirit. Before it was just worshipping the Father and the Son. And so then we move back to the Council of Nicaea and people think, oh, well, because the Council of Nicaea expanded on this statement regarding Christ and said that he was the true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, Therefore, the church wasn't acknowledging Christ as true God prior to that. Really, what's going on is, is the, the Nicene Creed and the Constantinopolitan Creed, which are both very similar to each other, are basically taking the original creed that the church had been using to catechize Christians, that that creed had a threefold structure. It was organized around Father, Son, and Spirit. Father is affirmed as the creator and maker of all things. The Son's the one who came down for our redemption. And the Spirit is the one who dwells in the church and uh, spoke by the prophets. 
That's what the church had always believed and confessed. And the only reason that the later creeds are now expanding on those remarks in, uh, in the ways that people now think are suddenly, you know, Trinitarian uh, is, is because heretics were coming along and disagreeing with the simple, otherwise clear and well-known statements uh, found in the Apostles' Creed. And so, for example, when, when Arius came along prior to the Council of Nicaea and said, Christ isn't true God, it wasn't suddenly as a backlash to uh, Arius that the church suddenly decided, oh, we better start saying he is God then, right? Now, Arius came along and was objecting to the teaching of the church that had already been uh, well underway, right? He was objecting to the teaching of his bishop, in fact. Uh, uh, Arius was just this piddling little preacher in a back alley in uh, Alexandria, but uh, Alexander was the bishop of, of Alexandria, and he was preaching the, the, the historic faith, Christ is the true God, become man. And so the Council of Nicaea was necessitated because Arius caused such a stir. But as soon as the, the bishops arrived at Nicaea, Arianism wasn't really all that difficult a matter to decide. The church immediately, within, within a very short period of time, the, the council said Arianism is rank heresy. The only difficulty that was faced at Nicaea was how do we accurately express this without veering off into language that leads people into error, right? Some people, some people were saying that uh, the Father and the Son were the same person, that those heretics were known as the modalists or Sabellians. Others were saying that the Father, Son, and Spirit are of a fundamentally different substance, and they were, trying, they were basically affirming polytheism. And so the church was trying to avoid both of those errors while expressing its historic faith. And that's what you get at Nicaea. You don't get a new doctrine. You don't get a new theology. You get a clarity uh, of expression that w was forced upon the church because of heretics like Arius. Mm. And uh, yeah, we'll have some, um, <clears throat> we'll have a few more, <laughs> we'll have a, uh, uh, a few more questions along those lines, but here we have uh, Metal Warrior says <laughs> that he was kidding, and uh, oh. <laughs> you, you could guess that because it, you know it's Metal Warrior apologist. Why would he be calling him an apologist? If it was, yeah. uh, uh, you know, <laughs> if he was if he believed dumb things like that. Um, so yeah, he said he was joking, and uh, he's worried that he's going to get banned. No, you're not getting banned. That's kind of a that was in the the friendly trolling category because uh, you know you're trying to get Anthony to talk about that <laughs> silly, silly issue. Um, oh, right here we have, uh, here you have it, Anthony. Here, now you're refuted. Crystal Sala. Yeah, the Trinity is a joke. There is one God, the Father. How would you respond to that airtight <laughs> argument? <laughs> well, that's a fundamental plank of Trinitarianism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> one of the things I think Christians and non-Christians should uh, get clearly in view is a definition of the doctrine of the Trinity, which allows you to see where the actual debate is. A lot of anti-Trinitarians think it's relevant to show passages where it says there's only one God, for example. Uh, you know, Arians think it's relevant to show passages where, where Jesus uh, spoke to his condescension, his self-humiliation, right, in, in becoming a man and, and dying on a cross and, and so forth and being exalted back to heaven. Uh, none of those things are relevant to the discussion of the Trinity and the differences that Christians have with non-Christians or Unitarians or polytheists or whoever. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity is that there's only one God. So there's absolutely no relevance to any person, you know, rattling off passages about the unity of God. I could do that all day long. Deuteronomy 4.35, Deuteronomy 4.39, Deuteronomy 6.4. I could keep that up all day. Nobody's going to point to a passage about the unity of God that David or I haven't heard, that David or I don't affirm, that the Christian church has not affirmed since before you know, any heresy was in the you know, sparkling in the eye of its uh, uh, eventual uh, beholder. Christians affirm the unity of God. It's a fundamental fact of Trinitarian doctrine. Secondly, Christians affirm that the Father is God. The Father is the one God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, John 17, 3, John 5. Numerous passages state that the Father is God. No Christian denies that. No Christian has denied that. No Christian would deny that. Christians also affirm that Christ and the Spirit are also God. Just like I can show passages that prove the deity of the Father, I can show passages that prove the deity of the Son. Hebrews 1, 8, the Father himself refers to the Son as God. When you look at just the writings of Paul, I mean, this, is, this actually just boggles the mind. 
Paul has 45 Old Testament citations that have the word Yahweh in them, right? When you look back at the Hebrew text he's quoting, it, it contains the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. And 33 uh, of those Old Testament citations in Paul are applied to Jesus. That means that the only 25%, if you will, are applied to the Father in Paul's writings. Now, for the life of me, I can't understand if the Father is Yahweh, and, and people would acknowledge that uh, from Paul's writings and other writings, what in the world prevents them from recognizing that Christ is Yahweh? He, he refers to Christ as Yahweh three times more than he refers to the Father as Yahweh, or 75% of the time. So uh, the Trinity affirms the deity of the Father, the deity of the Son, as well as the deity of the Spirit. The Spirit is clearly identified as God in 2 Samuel 23, where the Hebrew parallelism uh, alternates between referring to the speaker as the Spirit or as God. Uh, you have that sort of thing throughout the Old Testament. The Spirit's the one who spoke, and yet the Scriptures are repeatedly said to be the speech of God. Uh, numerous passages attribute to him divine attributes, as such as omnipresence, Psalm 139. Uh, on and on we could go with this sort of thing. Father, Son, and Spirit are each clearly identified as God and given the attributes of God, perform the works of God, and receive the worship of God. But you also have Father, Son, and Spirit being distinct, personally distinct, not just a distinction between uh, impersonal things or forces or, or you know some kind of abstractions. Scripture clearly distinguishes between Father, Son, and Spirit. Each person of the Trinity is portrayed as speaking. Often you have each person speaking to the other. You have the two sharing love between them, glorifying the other. So uh, those are the, the three basic planks of Trinitarianism. One God, Father, Son, and Spirit is each God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is each a distinct person. When Christians are debating with Unitarians, the debate is not over that first premise, uh, that there's one God. The debate is over whether Father, Son, and Spirit are each God. Right, so that's why that's why they always want to deflect and go over here because they think if they can pretend that's the debate, then uh, anybody who hears them demonstrating quite capably that there's only one God will then somehow be pers persuaded. Oh well, then the Trinity must not be true. But all they've done is is uh, engaged in a red herring. And so, uh, same thing can be said. You know, if uh, if I were debating a oneness Pentecostal, the 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 argument wouldn't be that. There's only one God. We both agree on that. Mm -hmm. The argument wouldn't be that Father, Son, and Spirit are God. We both agree on that. The argument would be that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct persons. That's where the debate is. But what do, what do one as Pentecostals do? They routinely point to passages that talk about the, the unity of God or the oneness of God when that's not the issue. And so it's really quite irrelevant to uh, have somebody like Chris Lasala tell us the, there's one God and he's the Father. Granted. <laughs> Christians believe that before heretics uh, were affirming it. A mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> couple of uh, little side questions here. Uh, Joe James says, David Wood, will you ever debate any Muslim scholar on stage again? Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I will. It's just becoming increasingly difficult uh, to do so. Like, like someone like Shabir Ali, I've never had any problems with Shabir Ali trying to, uh, you know, trick and deceive me ahead of time. But with a bunch of other Muslims, uh, matter of fact, the, the first give you an example. The first debate I was ever in with a Muslim, uh, the Muslim contacted me ahead of time and said, hey, um, you give me your four arguments that you're going to use in the debate, and I'm going to give you the four arguments I'll be using in the debate. And I was like, no, bring whatever arguments you want. I'll bring whatever arguments I want. I'm, I don't want to exchange ahead of time. What is this? Right. And he says, no, I insist that we each give four arguments that we're going to use and that we we bring up nothing else. And I will bring up nothing else except for these four arguments. And he demanded it, insisted on it. He kept demanding it or saying that the debate was over. So I said, fine, I'll agree. I sent him my four arguments. He sent me his four arguments. And on the day of the debate, he briefly mentioned one of his arguments and then completely changed all the rest of his arguments. He was completely now notice what 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 was the impact of that on me? I only studied for those four things. He said he said that he would only bring up those four arguments. So those that, that was all I prepared for. And then he brought up completely different arguments. And when I would when I would mention this to Muslims after the debate, they would say, ha ha, ha ha, you, you didn't have a good answer for that. I would say, well, he I, I didn't prepare for anything other than these four. And they say, oh, you fell for that. They didn't have any problem with him. It was it was I was the stupid one for falling for this. And this has happened over and over and over again with Muslim debaters. They just believe, hey, if you are against Islam, guess what? Muhammad said war is deceit. And we are in a kind, we are engaged in a kind of warfare here. And our goal is to trick and deceive you. 
And again, there are people like Shabir Ali. I've never had a problem with this. I've never had uh, problems with, with several other Muslims, but it's increased over time. <clears throat> um, I think year before last, Robert Spencer and I were in a two-on-two -two debate with two uh, Shia scholars. And the Shia Muslims, the Shia Muslims, um, they insisted that the debate be set up where they get to speak 10 minutes, uh, a 10 minute conclusion after our conclusion. And in that 10 minute conclusion, they broke all of the things that they made us agree to in the debate, right? They said, no bringing up politics, no doing this, no doing that, no doing this, no doing that, no personal attacks. And then when they get to speak for that 10 minutes and we have no chance to respond, they, they went down the line and broke everything that they had made us agree to. Um, and not only that, once they finish their 10 minutes, they say, oh, we want two more minutes. And then they went, they, they gave themselves extra time. Now, what do you do? What do you do when you're doing, when you're doing, when that's how your, your, your opponents act, right? Same thing with Muhammad Hijab, right? And, and, and the people setting up the debate, the, the rules of the debate were, um, no personal attacks, no going off topic, none of these things, friendly and respectful debate, right? Now, guess what? That's not me making the rule. I don't care if people are respectful towards me. I do care if you demand that the rule, if you establish as the rule, no personal attacks, things like that, and then you break them because how do I trust you? All right. So anyway, this thing, this keeps happening over and over and over again. And it is very, very rare to find a Muslim who cares when the debater on his side lies about the rules, demands rules, and then completely violates the rules. Um, you could ask 90, you could ask 100 Muslims, hey, do you have a problem? with these guys getting you to agree to rules and then breaking them. Do you have a problem with, you, you can ask a hundred Muslims, maybe one of them will have a problem with it. They, whereas if you ask a hundred Christians, a hundred Christians are gonna say, no, that's wrong, that's immoral, you can't do that. Uh, in Islam, it, it, it's just, it's based on deception. It's based on deception. They, they serve a prophet who is a deceiver. They serve a God who brags about being the best of all deceivers and shocker, um, shocker, they engage in a lot of deception. The debaters, the apologists, right? So I'm happy to engage in debates, but when I don't know what to do about that, right? I don't know what to do about that because I know here's, here's how the next debate will be set up. Here's how the next debate will be set up. It will go something like this. David, you have to debate us on this or you're a coward. And I will say, uh, well, I'm not a coward. I, I'd be happy to debate you. And they'll say, okay, well, we're going to host and these are the rules. You have to, do you agree to all these rules? And I'm going to say, guys, I really have a problem here because every time I get you guys, you, you guys uh, force me to agree to rules, uh, you break them. No, 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 we're not going to do it. And then we're going to go into the debate and they're going to break all the rules. And then I'm sitting there like an idiot. And how many times do I have to fall for that before I, uh, before I realize we're just dealing with compulsive liars in some of these apologists? And guess what? The Muslims, well, well, look at the Muslims in the comment section. See if they have any problem with their debaters doing that. I, I would be shocked if they do, unless they're just pretending to because... Every time I talk to Muslims, they have no problem with this sort of sort of thing. So, guys, I'm just going to it's going to have to be a situation where there are no rules. But I mean, who really wants to engage in a debate where there are no rules, no rules on format, no rules on, on you know, what can, what you can say? Um, it's kind of rough. Anyway, that's the situation. But that's the that's what Muhammad has produced in this world. All right. So here you go, Anthony. Um, wait, let me get this other one real quick and then we'll go to this one. Um, what is the best way to defeat Islam? Uh, well, I would say study the Muslim sources and uh, learn what's in the Muslim sources and share what you learn. Uh, that, that's the most straightforward way. Obviously, if you're a Christian, you want to also be sharing the gospel and so on. But I, I mean, because I don't know who Jeff Douglas is, you might be an atheist or whatever. Um, but for anyone, for anyone who is concerned about Islam, um, I'll be making a video here in the next couple of days um, just about how many Muslims are leaving Islam as soon as they start finding out what is in the Muslim sources. Muslims do not know. You could you could walk up to 100 Muslims and start bringing up some passages. 100 out of 100 Muslims have never heard what's in their sources, apart from a few scholars or a few apologists who who interact with the material to debate it. Um, this has been the, the material about Muhammad has been concealed from Muslims for 14 centuries. Um, if you learn that material and then put it in the faces of Muslims, they leave like it's a sport. I mean, they leave like they can't get out of Islam fast enough. And so um, learning what's in the Muslim sources and then sharing it with Muslims would be the way to go. All right, Anthony, we have Tez here. He says, so who came up with the Trinity? Not Jesus, not God, not the apostles. It's <laughs> got to be someone else. All right, Tez, let me throw the ball back into your court. Here's my question. What is the answer to two plus two? Now, let me just tell you before you give me the answer that it is, uh, four is not on the table. Four is not a viable answer. And other, what I'm trying to do is show you that 
Uh, basically, what you've done is you've set up the question. You've already determined that the answer can't be given, at least not the answer that I hold. You've asserted that the Trinity is not true implicitly. You've said it wasn't something revealed by God, by Christ, by the apostles. And so you've asked, who is it that came up with the concept of the Trinity? But that question is loaded. It assumes a answer that I don't hold to. The doctrine of the Trinity is not something that was made up by anyone. The doctrine of the Trinity is not something... Uh, that somebody has foisted upon the scriptures. The scriptures themselves forced Jews prior to Christians to come to the conclusion that God is multipersonal, specifically three persons, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, or the Father, the Angel of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit, something we looked at in our last broadcast and something I've done other videos on. Uh, as well as gone in print about. You can go to Answering Islam. You'll find numerous articles written by myself or Sam Shamoon and others on this topic. The, the, the material's out there. Uh, Christians believe that the Bible itself teaches that God is multipersonal. He's not a barren monad, an undifferentiated unity. In fact, think about it. The, the entire concept of a God who's, who's absolutely one with no kind of internal diversity itself collapses into a blank. It, uh, you know, what do you mean when you say that God is absolutely one to the exclusion of all plurality? I mean, if you really mean that, then you, you have to believe that God doesn't have a multiplicity of attributes like eternality, immutability, uh, aseity, right? Self-existence, uh, love, justice, mercy, those sorts of things. As soon as you start saying, no, God does have all those qualities, God does have all those attributes, you've now admitted, at least in principle, that God is not absolutely one in such a way as to rule out any and all kinds of plurality. But as soon as you admit that, you've lost in principle the argument against the Trinity, uh, at least a, a you know that prejudices the discussion beforehand. You, you're already admitting that God in principle is some kind of diversity. And when you turn to the scriptures and you find that there is a plurality of persons, uh, then you know there shouldn't be any question. There really shouldn't be all this... Uh, built-up hesitation. And, and the reason I bring that up is because usually people think that the, just the concept itself is is irrational, right? And so it's just, it just can't be something revealed in the Bible. It's got to be something that somebody made up. Uh, but no, the, the whole idea of God being uh, an internal diversity of persons and attributes subsisting in perfect unity, uh, you know, it's demanded if you want to believe that God is something other than just a blank. I mean, it, the other thing is, you know, a lot of people believe that the doctrine of the Trinity is a product of Greek philosophy. The, the irony is it was Greek philosophers who taught silly concepts like that the one is, you know, like in Plotinus, this, there's this absolute one that's undifferentiated, right? It has no qualities. It's, it's uh, to be stripped of all, uh, you know, attributes. Uh, that's not a, a biblical concept of God. That's more like uh, Greek philosophy. The Bible itself teaches that God is pluripersonal. And the, the fullness of that revelation in the scriptures leads us to the conclusion that that God is triune, tripersonal, Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, look at this guy who's trying to get us... 1,000 dead Trinitarians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chris. It's like... Uh, Chris, Chris, like, some advice, right? If you're trying to get someone to debate you, um, this is probably not the, the way to go about it, right? I mean, this is like... This is like Islam strategy, right? Just chest stomach. Ah, I'll destroy you all and stuff. And, and thinking that is impressing, impressing someone when it makes people not want to engage with you, right? So look, ch check this out. David Wood, I love you, but I'll debate you now live. Here's my record. 1,000 dead Trinitarians. Really? You killed a, you killed a thousand Trinitarians? So you're a mass murderer? Or you just mean you've had arguments with them, but you're describing them as dead. Well, guess what? It's not exactly the best way to uh, engage. In fact, I, dude, I just don't have time for this sort of nonsense. Um, so, all right. <laughs> Guys, I, 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 actually, I said it right at the beginning. I said, I don't have, I don't have time for this, right? We, 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 we have to get back to recording. We're trying to engage with some serious discussions. If you're sitting there running your mouth. I, I, I killed all these Trinitarians. Come on. Um, we got better stuff to do. All right. Now here's actually a good question that these are the kinds of questions we're uh, trying to actually, we, we, we wanted to talk about Islam and the Trinity. Uh, we've got plenty of material on that. Um, but I see some, some good, uh, some good questions here. Check this one out. Uh, Hayden Tang, <clears throat> he says, uh, Hey David and Anthony, do you have any advice for someone who wants to go into Christian apologetics? Hmm. Yes. Yes, we do. What would you say, Anthony? 
Well, we're both going to agree on this point. Um, <coughs> I'm sure we'll agree on much more as well, but we might also have some variation in directions perhaps. But uh, I, I, I think we're both going to agree here that you need to really get grounded in the scriptures. There's nothing that will do you any better in defending the faith than knowing the faith. And there is nothing that will outfit you better for responding to non-Christians than uh, knowing the Bible. Uh, and, and one thing is, I mean, just, just in terms of doing apologetics, nobody did apologetics better than Christ, right? I mean, mm. I remember as a non-Christian looking at the uh, arguments that Christ engaged in and just, I, I was often just overawed at the, the simplicity and pungency of the arguments. Sometimes I, I was sort of mystified. I thought, oh, I don't really think I get the argument here. And then the more I thought about it, I just, it just, it always struck me how brilliant uh, his the responses were so uh, and you also have the same sort of thing in the Apostle Paul uh, so certainly ground yourself in the scriptures know what it is that you're defending and learn from the scriptures themselves how how the faith is defended uh, the scriptures themselves supply a great deal of material relevant to their own defense right I mean you have predictive prophecy you have the internal consistency of scripture you have the accuracy uh, accuracy of scripture and speaking to the human condition which I think is a a relatively neglected area, but Scripture speaks to the heart of the issue, and Scripture is the only thing that really gives an adequate solution to that uh, dilemma that, that Scripture accurately describes. Uh, but then, beyond that, uh, as far as getting into apologetics, obviously you want to go with uh, the people who, who have uh, uh, been demonstrating what that defense looks like and doing so uh, well over the years. I'll, I'll leave that to David, uh, but uh, I, I would simply emphasize the Scriptures. Yeah, I would. Uh, <clears throat> I would say basically, uh, there are certain things that you, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to get into Christian apologetics, there are certain issue, issues that everyone who goes into Christian apologetics should be learning. Um, and if you look at the the Book of Acts, the when the apostles went out and preached, um, they had been with Jesus for a few years. Jesus had talked about all kinds of different issues. But the 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 sort of takeaway message that the apostles wanted to go out and spread was a message about his. Um, death for sins, his resurrection, and his divine nature. So I think it goes without saying every Christian needs to be able to defend those basics, right? Uh, now, since, I mean, there weren't like atheists back then, but uh, now since you have to interact with atheists, you you probably want um, a case for the existence of God. But So it would be that. It would be the basics of the gospel. And after that, it would kind of be what area you want to go into, right? Like if you're interested it's it's very different. There, there aren't many people who can be a completely all around apologist ready for everything that might come from every, you know, every sort of uh, critic. Right. Um, so if you want to be a good apologist, you kind of have to focus on one or two or maybe three areas. So if you're interested in Islam, then you would want to uh, learn about Islam. Uh, there, I would I would go to answering Islam and start reading the articles. Pick a pick a topic you're interested in. Start start reading articles on that. Watch videos on on whatever topics you're interested in. Um, or if you're interested in interacting with atheists or with cults and things like that, basically pick what you're interested in most. Or you know, if you have a friend who happens to be in a cult or an atheist or a Muslim or something like that, uh, that's a good place to start as well. And so, uh, uh, one one thing I did want to bring up because I think it's underrated is the art of asking questions. I say that because lots of people just charge in, just charge in with the arguments and the evidences that they that they have uh, learned. And you might not know where that person is or what that person's actual objections are. And so uh, you to save yourself from wasting a lot of time, I tend to start off with questions. Whoever I'm talking to, I start asking questions. What do you believe about this? If I'm talking to a Muslim, it's, hey, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about Muhammad, what do you believe about the Quran? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about Jesus and things like that? Just keep asking questions. And after a while, I start transitioning into uh, why questions. So instead of just what do you believe, it's why do you believe this? And that's when I start getting a feel for the person's reasons. Why does this person believe in this? And then once you have that person's reasons, then you can actually focus on those reasons. And you can actually go and start studying those, that person's particular reasons so that you can have a, a question. I mean, uh, you can have a discussion that's actually right on point. And not, you know, just just taking the, the 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 cookie cutter approach to to everyone. All right, so that would be that would be some advice on uh, on getting started there. And if you're if you're planning on if you're thinking of being an academic apologist, then you'd you'd also want to decide uh, 
what sort of uh, background field you want, right? Because history, right? Learning, learning history, uh, getting a history degree, that can be helpful because then you can do like historical Jesus studies and stuff. That's, that's awesome for apologetics or the history of the church. Um, for interested in science, that's cool. Biology or physics or something like that. That can, you can use that for arguments for the existence of God and so on. Philosophy, philosophy is good for everything because philosophers basically spend all their time, um, examining arguments. So, you you can use that in, in a variety of ways. So anyway, that would be some uh, that would be our thoughts on <clears throat> going into Christian apologetics. Um, all right, did you want to? Uh, oh, we could. I was looking. For those that don't know, when you see me looking this way, it's because I'm looking at another screen that shows me uh, the questions that are rolling up. Somebody told you, by the way, to stop your aggression against the messenger of Allah. Hey, hey, check this out. <laughs> this, this is like. This is probably Muhammad Hijab. <laughs> he keeps saying, I love this live stream when Muhammad Hijab yeah. ended David Wood and he couldn't take it. It's so funny. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, he ended his career. I don't think David's doing live streams anymore. Yeah. Is, by the way, is this I don't a, think he's it, producing videos. Do you? No. Uh -uh. Is this the same <laughs> Muhammad Hijab? <laughs> David says that Allah prays to Muhammad. It's not two, it's four. It's not two, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Allah doesn't pray to Muhammad. He prays I, for Muhammad. You know, I don't, uh, maybe I haven't seen all the shows where you've commented on it, but uh, I, I usually try and keep up even if I'm not on the show. But uh, I don't know if people really understand how much fun we had after after that whole debacle. Look, this guy keeps right? posting the same thing over and over again. Uh, yeah, be honest, Dave. You got owned by Muhammad Hijab. The Muhammad Hijab who boasted that Allah prays. <laughs> and the crowd cheered, right? Yeah. I, I wanted, I wanted to... Just keep going making videos about Muhammad Hijab, but I just thought, nah, well, you know, I can't just spend my life on one person. But there was just so much fodder there to to play with. Uh, I mean, I one of the things that, and I did a video on this, right? He in the debate, he wanted to make much of the fact that he knew Arabic and that David didn't, even though he ends up agreeing with David's comments about the Arabic, pretending that he's not agreeing, uh -huh. right? Yeah, and, and yeah, a lot just, of just, just, yeah, just 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 <laughs> just to review, just to review. I got up and I said, guys, this is a problem. Because according to the Quran, Allah prays for Muhammad. Allah prays for him. It's right there. Surah 33, verse 56. It's right there. Uh, by the way, it's, it's in the Quran and the Hadith. Allah prays for Muhammad. Muhammad Hijab gets up and says, Ha, huh, now I have to correct him. Oh, what an embarrassing. Oh, man, this is a career-ending mistake. Oh, let me correct your Arabic. It's not to Muhammad. It's for Muhammad. What did I say? I said for Muhammad, right? So he completely lies about what I said. Uh, and, and then says that actually that Allah prays for Muhammad, which is exactly the point I was making. Who is Allah praying? Who, who is Allah praying to if he's praying for Muhammad? Is he praying to himself or is he praying to someone else who would then be God, right? So very simple point. He agreed with what I actually said. 100% he agreed with what I actually said. And what did the audience do? They cheered. Yay, thank you for refuting David. This is like a perfect point, right? We were just talking about how just it's, all it's all deception, right? It's, 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 hey, this guy is my enemy. And so it's okay to just go on a, a tirade of lies, completely misrepresent what he said, completely lie about what we're going to do in the debate, lie about everything, and then the audience is too clueless to realize what's going on in front of them. And so it's mm. it's really, and, and notice right here, I mean, you got owned, you got, yes, he, he admitted that Allah prays, but that, that he owns you when he did that. And what do you mean by owning? You mean getting a bunch of Muslims to cheer for whatever you said, even if you're talking about your God praying. Music, locate, your God prays according to Muhammad Hijab. The crowd cheered when they heard that their God prays. Yay, our God prays. Our God prays. Allah prays. The God of Muhammad prays for him. Wow. This is some, this is amazing yeah. religion here. Yeah. And so in, in the context of that, you know, I pointed out that he was chiding you for making comments about Arabic, even though you were right about the Arabic. But then he goes on to wax eloquent about Hebrew, when he doesn't know Hebrew, and I pointed out numerous grammatical mistakes that he made with respect yeah. to the Hebrew language, he suggested that the plural term Elohim is only ever used in conjunction with a singular verb. That's ordinarily the case. That's a you know relevant enough observation in some contexts, but it's not true in all contexts. There are instances where the plural term Elohim is used for the true God in conjunction with plural verbs. I gave examples uh, yesterday on the broadcast of plurals being used for God, Genesis uh, 2013, Genesis 35, 7. Uh, and I'm not simply talking about the, the pronouns like you see in 126, uh, 
three twenty two eleven seven of Genesis or Isaiah six eight, although those are relevant too. But but my point is he was making these comments about uh, uh, Hebrew after chiding you for talking about Arabic and his knowledge of Hebrew uh, was just abysmal. Every single comment that he made about Hebrew in that debate was was false. <laughs> And yet, I'm sure that's, if we go back and look at it, that was one of the occasions when he's getting, mm. you know, claps from everybody. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, it, guys, this goes back, and, and the only, you know, the, the only reason we're talking about it, because this is obviously a troll, right? We're, we're here to discuss a topic, and there are people who always come along to try to distract from whatever topic we're trying to address and get, and get us to uh, to go down a, a different path. Um, but earlier, when when I was asked if I'll, if I'll be debating Muslims in the future, I, I mentioned the problem, right, that a lot of the Muslims I've interacted with have just considered it a virtue, a great deed, if they can get you, the Christian debater, to agree to things, to, to agree to rules that they then violate every last one of them. Um, and this is considered a good thing. So so you take this situation, right? Um, since Music Locate brings it up, um, I, I, I'm told, hey, we, we're going to have this debate and here are the rules, respectful debate, no going off topic. Here are the topics that won't be brought up, but hijab violated everything we agreed to every last one down the line in every section of the debate and and it, other people no, other people were in on the rules no one cared no one cared about this but then in the course of the debate it's lie upon lie upon lie right it's pointing a finger at me ha ha david doesn't know the arabic and then he completely agrees with what i actually said about the arabic right so he's lying about what i said and then agreeing that allah prays and then this is a career ending defeat and then he, he does what? And then it's, well, let me tell you all about the Hebrew. And everything he says is wrong, right? And that's considered, notice, you see right here from the Muslims, that's considered good. Yes, you're lying to the Christian. You're lying to the audience. You're lying about the Hebrew. You're lying about the Arabic. You're lying about everything. Lie, 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 lie. That's our champion. That's who we want representing us. Is this the religion of truth, ladies and gentlemen? Is the religion of truth the religion mm. that is built from top to bottom upon lies, lie after lie after lie. And the best apologist we can bring forward is the one who lies most. Is this the religion of truth? How can it be? I don't know. But by, by the way, I don't know if Music Locate is, is a Muslim. I would assume so since he's uh, <clears throat> cheering for hijab. But uh, I just thought it was ironic that his name is Music Locate. <laughs> if, if you're a Muslim, Music Locate. <laughs> <laughs> you love some uh, music, huh? You, you, have some, you have some stuff to learn about what your prophet said about music. According to Orthodox Islamic scholars, the, the music is the Quran of Shaitan. I mean, mm -hmm. I could I could cite numerous scholars, even Taymiyyah, even contemporary Muslims who uh, make this point routinely. But there are hadiths where Muhammad talks about people engaging in the use of musical instruments being turned into, uh, you know, apes and monkeys, just like the Jews who violated the Sabbath uh, or disfiguring their faces and so forth. So. Uh, Islam is inimical to music, so I don't know why your name would be Music Locate. Mm -hmm. If if you're a Muslim, I don't I don't know if you're a Muslim, or if you haven't yet located who who or what you are. Um, John Singleton, yo, we want that's, that's to Chris Lasala's, uh, yo, we want padre. to debate you on the Trinity. So this is the guy who's oh my record is a thousand dead Trinitarians. That's his, that's his uh, sidekick, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, grow up a little, John, and. Um, Actually, you know, actually, you and Sam are both debating oneness guys this summer, right? But I think these guys are Aryans. So just just so you guys know, we saw the the question on the last video about the possibility of a a debate, John Singleton, Chris Lasala, uh, versus David and I, and we were discussing that a little bit. Uh, and I looked up I looked up some of their stuff, and I think the guys are Aryans. I haven't. Uh, I haven't listened to more than five minutes of your material, so I'm really not certain. But if so, uh, I could get Sam, and there's a possibility we could set something up with them. Uh, I won't say anything for certain uh, just yet, because as we can see here, there there are, you know, certainly some antics involved in their in their. Yeah, method. Gu guys, but, we. I mean, I don't mind people being feisty, you know. And, uh, yeah, at, at I, I don't. Either, but it's like <laughs> it's it's almost like when you. And again, you know, people like Shabir are respectful and so on, but a, 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 like the younger generation where it's all just chest thumping uh, 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 and lying and so on uh -huh. and this boasting and it's all they're trying to do is show that they're the biggest chest thumper and the crowd just eats it up. Oh, yeah, that's our champion. Doesn't matter what what the actual he could be saying anything. He could be he could be saying our God prays. He could be saying that Allah prays. 
uh, implying polytheism, and we don't care as long as he's thumping his chest while he said that, right? The reason for debating other people would to be to kind of get a break from that, right? Because you feel like you just want to take a shower after after interacting with people like that, right? And so, you know, that, that's part of the reason I debate. The, the atheists are, are I, I, I hate to say it, but, um, you know, for, for the sake of the Muslims here, but the atheists I've, I've had debates with, and I've had a number of debates, uh, have been the, the complete opposite of some of the people like Muhammad Hijab and so on, right? Um, they, they, they haven't tried, they haven't tried anything deceptive or duplicitous. Uh, they haven't twisted the rules and th they haven't done that sort of thing. Right. So I kind of, you know, would like to focus on debating atheists for a little while, just because it's like a breath of fresh air compared to some of the other, some of the other people representing Islam, but to then have, you know, uh, oneness guys or Aryans or whatever, and come along and you're just acting just like the, you know, the chest thumpers, gosh, I mean, I might as well just go, I might as well go debate, you know, some Muhammad Hijab fan or Muhammad Hijab again or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, all right. Did you want to actually talk about our topic? We're not going to go terribly long tonight because we do have to get back to um, what we're here for. <laughs> still, still posting it over and over again. Muhammad Hijab owns you. No way to defeat Islam by 2070. Oh. It'll surpass Christianity. <laughs> I like the way that I like the way it's punctuated. It looks no way to defeat it till 2070. <laughs> so I guess 2071 is uh, the year you're looking for. No, no, no. no. For. I, I think you say no way to defeat <laughs> I know Islam. What I'm saying. By 2070, it'll surpass yeah. Christianity. Well, that's why I say the punctuation. <laughs> There's no punctuation there. So I'm reading it like no way to, to defeat Islam uh, by 2070, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it'll surpass Christianity as an <laughs> independent statement, but. Yeah, uh, um, I'm not sure about that. When I look at, when I look around at all of the people um, leaving Islam, it, it's like it's it's like it's going like this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's growing at a geometric rate. Back when back when Nabil um, became a Christian, it was very common back then to say no one ever leaves Islam, right? No one has ever left Islam. And the few people who say they've left Islam, they're all liars. They're 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 they were never Muslims. Um, and I don't, I just don't mean, oh, they're from some, some heretical sect or something like that. I mean, they're just lying. These guys were actually Jews or Christians, and they're just lying about what they were in order to deceive people. Now, gosh, how many, how many former, how many ex-atheists, I mean, how many ex-Muslim channels are there? They're just endless, right? And, uh, I watched an Abdullah Samir video. I think it was from last year, but he was posting, uh, he posted a video from, uh, Bilal Phillips. And Bilal Phillips was saying, look, based on statistics, this is going to get bad. This is like an avalanche, an avalanche of apostasy. Yeah. In fact, you may not have seen it. Uh, shortly after your debate with Muhammad Hijab, he was talking with Ali Dawa, and they were talking about the urgency of people sending them money. And, if, you know, what's the surprise there? They love to talk about other people getting paid for things. And here they are talking about the urgency of people spending, uh, sending them money so they can get... Uh, the, the dawah out there, right? And uh, they, they were saying the, the urgency is that so many people are leaving Islam. Mm -hmm. So informed Muslims know that it's not growing like they think it is. And uh, there are a lot of people leaving the religion. And besides that, I don't know what they really think. Uh, you know, the, the Muslims are not unified, right? Muslims are broken up into radically different warring sectarian groups that will ultimately, you know, end up, uh, you know, offing a number of the others anyways, right? I mean, so it's almost like uh, the more Islam spreads and these groups come into contact with each other, there's also going to be a, a decrease as a result of, you know, Muslims killing Muslims. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it, you're just, just based on, so there's, a, there's the Pew Research study um, about Islam growing. And just so you guys know, it's due to birth rates. It's due to birth rates because of Islam's impact on women, right? If, if you have a country where there's little to do, there's little for women to do, they don't go out and have careers because you just, you, you turn them into baby making machines when they're 13 or 14 years old. Um, then you just have more kids than, than other groups. And so that's why that's the main reason Islam is growing because of its impact on, uh, on women. And so Islam is growing rapidly. And based on this, uh, Islam is set at, at current rates of growth to surpass Christianity as the world's biggest religion in a few decades. But as Anthony pointed out, what does that mean? What, where are Muslims not killing their fellow Muslims? Where are Muslims not pointing a finger at other Muslim groups and saying, you're, you're, you're doing this wrong, so you have to die and slaughtering each other? Do you think that's suddenly going to stop as the numbers rise? Right? Do you think that's going to stop? So... 
I don't know what I don't know what your point is, man. If you're saying, oh, Islam is growing so fast. Yeah, that, that means it's going to be a bloodbath, not just for non-Muslims, but for Muslims as well. That's just what Islam does. That's the impact Islam has on the world. Bloodshed, death, deception. What a wonderful religion that these guys are defending here. Um, all right, so here we have, back to this, la ilaha illallah, Allah is the creator of all. David would don't be arrogant and mock Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because if you mock one messenger, you have mocked all of them. Are we mocking a messenger of God, Anthony? No, Muhammad was a false prophet. The, the most, most obvious, obvious false prophet <laughs> in history. The most obvious That's false prophet in history. That's why kids would say jinx. No. <laughs> Again, uh, look, uh, support good and righteousness. If I say right now, hey, I'm a prophet and all the other prophets agreed with me and you make fun of me, are you saying that you have therefore made fun of all prophets, including Muhammad? Is that what you would say? Would that not be the stupidest? Would that not be the stupidest thing anyone has ever said in the history of humanity? In fact, it, it, the reasoning here really should be, you know, turned back upon him. He says, if we mock one messenger, we've mocked them all. Mm -hmm. Well, then, by the same token, if Muhammad mocked one messenger, he mocked them all. Yep. Muhammad mocked the Lord Jesus Christ, yep, not yep. merely a messenger, but the messenger par excellence. Mm -hmm. Scripture says that all the prophets pointed to him and that he would be the supreme revelation of God, which indeed is stated in John 1.18, in John 14, when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, in Hebrews 1.1-3, 1, 1 through 3, where Christ is said to be the express image and glory of the Father, so inasmuch as Muhammad denigrated the Lord Jesus Christ, said he is not Lord, said that he is not God's incarnate uh, you know, son, in fact, uh, absolutely abominated the notion that Christ is his son, insofar as Muhammad did all those things and a hundred other abominations, he's guilty of mocking all the prophets and the greatest prophet, the last prophet, the only prophet who could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so... I mean, seriously, guys, I mean, you, you got an illiterate seventh century caravan trader, caravan robber who comes along, um, can't stop having sex with a with a nine year old girl, um, sees the beautiful wife of his own adopted son, abolishes adoption so that he can justify having her um, takes sex slaves. Right. Gets in trouble with his wives for for uh, for having sex with one of his uh, sex slaves in the wife of in, in the bed of one of his own wives gets in trouble for things like that. Uh, and Allah justifies it every step of the way. Again, obsessed with how his followers go to the bathroom and how they trim their beards and how they, they what, what they do with their armpit hair and their pubic hair is all these little grooming practices. This is clearly, clearly a dude who was suffering from some, from some serious mental health problems. And this guy simply says, every prophet and messenger who came before him agreed with him. And in the process, he's insulting every last one of them. So, sorry, friend, but your prophet mocked everyone, and especially, especially the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you thank know, you for condemning your prophet. You know, another thing is, you know, one one of the things that we say that a Muslim would 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 point to and say that's an example of us mocking Muhammad. <clears throat> uh, well, one example is that we would say that Muhammad showed some very strong evidence of. Uh, being demon possessed, the, you know, we can we can discuss what accounts for Muhammad's peculiar behavior and all those sorts of things, and whether or not he was demon possessed or it requires that. But but the fact is, when that issue is broached and Christians, you know, entertain that as a possible explanation, you know, another explanation he was he was just a brazen huckster, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, or or it could be a combination of those two things. But but the, my point in bringing it up is, we weren't the first persons to think of Muhammad being demon possessed, right? Uh, Who? <laughs> we do happen to know the first person in history to think that Muhammad was demon possessed, right? The first, the first one. And you're going to say, "Ooh, that evil person, that must be the most evil person ever to think that Muhammad was possessed by a demon. Uh, I don't remember the name of this this genius, this this scholar, Anthony. But uh, who was the first person in all of history to think that Muhammad was demon possessed? Well, I guess I guess it depends where we're where we're starting in terms of Muhammad's. Uh, if we're talking about when he uh, the the start of his alleged prophethood. Yeah. Well, or, yeah, you could. Yeah, or, if you could go, go back, back to the further, childhood. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, well, <laughs> the, the the person would have to be Muhammad himself. Yeah. Right. Uh, Muhammad's the one who fled from the cave and. I wanted to commit suicide on numerous occasions, saying, "Woe is me! I'm a poet or possessed." Which, uh, for the for the Arab at that time, the the reason the the Arabs could excel at poetry was because they were possessed by the desert jinn, those mis mischievous spirits who you know are, are responsible for all sorts of uh, unseemly things. 
Muhammad thought that when this being was telling him uh, to recite, that he was actually being called as one of these, you know, poets. And so he thought this, this was an occasion of being possessed. And it didn't help any that this being proved to be a malevolent spirit, right? When Muhammad uh, initially resists the command, we're told this being manhandles him, you know, chokes him, and Muhammad's about to pass out. He's about to tap out, you know, and uh, this being lets go of him. And uh, this happens three times before Muhammad finally submits, right? This is the original act of submission. This malevolent spirit that manhandles Muhammad, slaps him around like a UFC fighter, uh, telling him to recite. Muhammad saying he's being possessed. You know, this is the origin of Islam, but it's also the origin of Muhammad's initial suspicions that he's possessed. And that suspicion uh, seems to have lingered with him throughout his entire career, in fact. Um, what in the name of common sense is this? You just miss your... You just completely misrepresented what Chris said and played the victim card when you were challenged to a debate. Don't pull that card at X-17 Apologetics. So I assume he's talking to me. The only thing I said about Chris is that I read, what, I read his comment, right? Yeah, yeah. A thousand, a thousand dead, dead Trinitarians. A thousand dead. Wow. What, what does, does that he, mean? Does he have <clears throat> tattoos underneath his eye representing all the Trinitarians he's slayed? Yeah. He just sounds like an inmate in a prison boasting of the people he's, I, I know, guys. He's shanked. <laughs> if, you, if you guys are serious about the debate, you, are, you couldn't be further off the mark if you're trying to set up a debate. You know how you do that? Guys, uh, we believe that you're wrong on this issue, and we believe that it's an important issue. We'd like to get together and have a debate on this. Are you interested in? Are you interested in that? That's how you do it. Yeah. Not, not, not flooding, not trolling and flooding the comments section and, and boasting and thumping your chest. A thousand dead Trinitarians. And I say, oh, a thousand dead Trinitarians. Ah, oh, you're misrepresenting what he said. Don't, don't, don't pull that cart. Dude, you're like the opposite of the kind of people we would like to interact with. Like the opposite. You could, you couldn't be further off the mark. Oh. Yeah. Besides that, is it, is it all that hard? Uh, I'll just speak. I'll just ask David about myself. Is it all that hard to get me to debate? I mean, no. I <laughs> no, you're, you're, again, you're, you're you're debating a oneness guy. Um, you you you, yeah. you you just debated that. Uh, well, I'm going to debate debate Anthony Buzzard's right hand man, uh, Carlos <laughs> Xavier, in August here on this channel. I've been in uh, I've been in sixty some debates. It's not uh, hard to debate me, but dudes, if you if you come yeah. along, matter, dude, I don't have time for this guy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Post another comment. See what happens. <laughs> All right, um, we did. Well. <laughs> nothing david says about christianity is true he changed it all at the council of youtube in 2019 <laughs> that's funny i'm assuming that's some that's some epic uh epic uh, trolling there um all right let's go ahead and yeah we don't want to go again we're not going too long right now but let's go ahead and address because we did call this we, we just ended up taking questions but um <laughs> we did post that this is islam and the trinity so you've talked about the trinity now Pick a problem. Pick a problem with Islam. Pick a problem with Islam that has to do with the Trinity, okay. and break that down for us. Okay. So uh, just, just so is... just so people don't say, "Hey, you never talked about your topic." We'll we'll go ahead and do it. Well, I, I guess I guess if it's Islam and the Trinity, right? we did talk about <laughs> Islam and we talked about the Trinity. So technically, technically, yeah. we did we did uh, deal with the topic. But but let's just get some interaction there. Uh, by the way, let me let's, let me say this real quick because John Singleton's bringing up here a irrelevant point. He says Elohim and Echad are horrible arguments. Don't even try to walk down that road. Nobody tried to walk down that road. That wasn't my argument. I, I, I've <laughs> I've had many years of Hebrew. Didn't he just tell me I was misrepresenting? Yeah, mm. yeah I, don't, I, I, I never appealed to Elohim as itself as an argument for the doctrine of the Trinity. My observation was that uh, Muhammad Hijab was simply wrong with respect to the Hebrew language when he said that Elohim is always used in conjunction with singular terms when used to refer to the true God. That's simply not true. And if you think it's true, then you're wrong too, and you don't know Hebrew any better than he does. I also didn't appeal to Echad. My argument for the Trinity wouldn't be that the term Echad could be used to refer to uh, <clears throat> compound things. That's determined by, when it says, for example, one grape or one cluster of grapes, the, the, the plurality is not in the term Echad, but in the word that it's used uh, to modify or to uh, in conjunction with. I did, but I didn't make that argument for the Trinity. My view of God is that he is one. I don't have any argument against that. I don't need to, uh, you know, make any silly argument. But but wait, wait, so, wait. Uh, it, it's possible he was responding to someone else. I didn't see the comment from someone else, but is well, he responding well, he, to you or something? He someone is saying next next you'll be telling me that the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Oh. Crazy. Yeah, I, I, I just I just <laughs> well, wanted, I just wanted to point out here. So, check, oh, okay. Oh, check this out, uh, John Singleton. Yes, you'll have to you'll have a respectful debate. 
as long as your triple-headed dog god is safe from our grasps. Oh, brother. Could could this uh, guy... <laughs> this guy, I mean, this guy has 50 views on his... I, I was willing to entertain a debate with him, but now he thinks he's got just this... He's bombastic. He, he thinks he's got yeah, this... Yeah, and this is... Like, I, I, I told him, I like... Dude, act like look, and then you know. Look, and by the, the way, the five nice minutes character assassination. Right, you know the five minutes I told you I watched of his what video. A this down, guy's gone, man. Those guys are out of time for this. I, 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 listen, I told you I watched his video. I watched five minutes of it downstairs. I heard the guy say, "I've been a Christian for a year. <clears throat> Most of the time, I had been a Trinitarian, but now I've changed my argument." So here's this guy. He's he's been. I uh, maybe. I hope I'm I'm not misrepresenting you in this. I watched five minutes. You know, give me some grace if I if I didn't catch the the. I've just read something. a couple of comments. Yeah. I'm like, this yeah, is but, the last guy. But I'm saying, from what I caught, he was saying he's been a Christian for a year. So here he is pretending to wax eloquent about the Hebrew language. I can tell you that reading a couple of Unitarian arguments about the Trinity, or even reading a I couple of eight Trinitarian, videos. Yeah, you, you don't know Hebrew. You're gonna you're, you'll be completely out of your depth. You know, I, I would have been happy debating you, but if you want to be bombastic, you know, I can be the Apostle Paul, right? You know, if you, you're a Judaizer, you're boasting in your Judaism. You know, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. I studied under Gamaliel. I've had years of instruction in the biblical languages, both Hebrew and Greek. Uh, I can tell you, you don't know Hebrew or Greek. You're over here pretending I've made arguments I haven't made. I can tell you, you're not going to do well in the debate. And uh, David's doing you a favor by... Uh, Giving you the axe. Mm -hmm. Giving right. you the bud row. All right, now let's actually get to the topic, and then we'll take some more questions, and we'll wrap it up. All right, go ahead. Oh, what are we doing? I'm You're gonna... addressing a topic. Uh, oh, I am. We've been here an hour. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, one, one thing we can say about Islam with respect to the Trinity is that Muhammad didn't get the Trinity right. Really? Right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, if the Quran comes from Allah... I... It makes sense that a 7th century caravan robber who's, you know, illiterate... Uh, has never read a book on it in, in his life, and he hears Christians talking about the Father, and he hears them talking about the Son, and he hears them saying Trinity, it makes sense to me that that guy would misunderstand or misinterpret what people mean by the Trinity. But if the Quran is from Allah, I would at least expect Allah to get it right. So I have to correct you there. When the Quran speaks, that's Allah's word. And so if Allah is the one who's speaking, then that is going to be a correct discussion and refutation of the doctrine of the Trinity. You would think so. You would think so. However, uh, now, now here, uh, the way I like to approach this is uh, th there, there's, there are passages in the Quran that increase in clarity with respect to this charge. So I like to begin with the most obscure and then work my way up to the, to the more clear. But what I want everybody to do is I, I look at some of these is just sort of think of this in terms of uh, uh, what, what I'm suggesting, at least. I, David's got another opinion, apparently. <laughs> no, uh, but... Uh, I'm suggesting that Muhammad believed that Mary was the third person of the Trinity or one of the members of the Trinity. And of course, that's not new. A lot of you, that if you've been watching the show, I, I do you not know believe that. what you're saying right now, Anthony. <laughs> there is so, no way something like that. You're talking, you must be talking about hadith, which are words, you know, extra words. I'm talking about the Quran, which is Allah's words, the words of Allah. And those have to be perfect. So go ahead and correct yourself. Okay, so Surah 4, 171 is the first verse relevant to this. O people of the scripture, that's Jews and Christians, do not commit excess in your religion or say about Allah except the truth. So whatever Muhammad is criticizing here as excess uh, is, is it regards Allah, and it, here's, here's what it is. It says, the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was but a messenger of Allah and his word, which he directed to Mary, and a soul from him, or a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and do not say three, desist, it is better for you. Indeed, Allah is but one God, exalted is he above having a son. Now, there are several things to notice here. The Quran pits the threeness of the Trinity against the oneness of Allah. So in other words, the, the, when, when it says desist, don't say three, because Allah is but one God, it's uh, asserting that, that Christians who believe in the Trinity are believing in three gods. Not simply three persons, which is the orthodox doctrine. So already you've got an error, right? Already you have Allah saying that Allah, uh, that Allah is, or Muhammad saying Allah is one, over and against the Christian view that Allah is three. Now, Christians need to be clear on this. When we say that God is three, we're not saying three gods. We're not referring 
to the divine nature, the essence or being of God, we're referring to uh, the persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So uh, by virtue of the Quran uh, opposing that in the name of the oneness of God, it's, it's ultimately wrong when it says uh, that Christians believe in three gods. But, but did you notice that uh, the, the three that are mentioned in the verse, it doesn't come right out and say those three comprise this, uh, the three of the Godhead, but these are the only persons mentioned in the verse. And so at least it, it, it's at least suggested there, right? O people of the scripture, do not commit excess in your religion or say about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah and his word, which he directed to Mary, uh, and, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers do not say three. These are the only three that have been mentioned in the passage. So when you move to the next passage, which is Surah 5, verse 17, there's greater clarity. Here in Surah 5, 17, it says, They have certainly disbelieved who say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. So notice you have Christ and Mary mentioned again. Say, then who could prevent Allah at all, if he had intended to destroy Christ, the son of Mary, or his mother. You notice that? When the Quran wants to refute this charge of Christians for believing in three gods, it, it specifically says this can't be true, because if Allah wanted to, he could destroy Christ and his mother. Why bring up his mother in a context about the Christian belief in, allegedly, three gods, and, and say this is a legitimate refutation. It's irrelevant to the Trinity to say that Allah can destroy Mary unless you think the Trinity is belief in Mary as one of the members of the Trinity. <clears throat> well, and just to go back to what, what I what I had mentioned earlier, um, think about this, guys, right? Because we're trying to understand how, you know, Muhammad came to the views and how these claims ended up in the Quran and so on. <clears throat> but think about someone like Muhammad going around the Arabian Peninsula. He's a caravan trader and a caravan robber. Uh, he meets some Christians, many of them heretical and so on. But he hears Christians talking about the Trinity. He hears them talking about the Father. He hears Christians talking about Jesus, the Son. And he hears Christians talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. If you didn't know what the Bible actually said, because you couldn't read it, and you didn't bother to seriously investigate Trinitarian theology to find out what Christians mean, what might you assume? You might assume that when they're talking about the Trinity, they mean a Trinity made up of father, mother, and son. Something that no Christian group holds to. Something that the Bible doesn't teach. Something that Christians themselves would say is utterly ridiculous, right? But that's what the Quran puts forward as our view of the Trinity which may, guys, there's only two possibilities here. There's only two possibilities. Either Allah is ignorant of what Christians actually believe and Christians actually claim. Either he's ignorant, so he's trying to he's trying to refute what Christians believe, but he's just getting it wrong because he doesn't know, in which case Allah isn't God. Or Allah does know what Christians believe, but instead of telling people accurately what we believe and then refuting that, he lies about it. He lies about it to to convince his followers that it's that it's a it's a really stupid doctrine, right? So which one is it? Your God, Muslims, you Muslims who are watching, your God is either ignorant or deceptive. He's ignorant or he's deceptive. Which one? If I were you, I would go with the deceptive because again, this is the God who brags about being the best of all deceivers. Take it, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh one more passage with respect to this error. And this one actually has a lot of interesting errors in it. But uh, uh, for now, the, the relevant error is with respect to the, the nature of God. Uh, in Surah 5, uh, 116, this is what Allah al will allegedly ask Jesus, right? He's going to ask Jesus a question. And, and here comes the question. It says, Beware of the day when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as two deities besides Allah. So here you have the three folks, and Allah is specifically asking Jesus, Jesus, did you teach people this error? Uh, I guess it's like Tez earlier, right? Tez said, who introduced this doctrine? Allah wants to know the answer to that too, because Allah doesn't know. 
So Allah's asking Jesus, did you teach this error to men? But then Jesus will say, exalted are you. It was not for me to say that which I have no right to say. If I had said it, then you would have known it. You know what's in my soul. I don't know what's within your soul. Right now, here I'm being very literal to the Arabic because uh, it's not just wrong when it attributes to Christians the belief that the son and his mother are members of the Trinity, but it's also wrong uh, in affirming that Allah has a soul unless Muhammad's conception of God was very different than the God of the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, here, Muhammad attributes to Allah a soul, and uh, he compares it to the soul of Isa. So there can't be any question what's meant by this. He, uh, Jesus says, I don't know what's in your soul. You know what's in my soul. Uh, and that's that's problematic, too. Uh, we, we've talked about the issue of anthropomorphism in the Quran, but one of the things that Arabic scholars point out is that the word for soul in particular refers to, so you have two words in Hebrew at least, you have, or in Arabic, excuse me, uh, you have the, the word for spirit, and you have the word soul, but soul specifically refers to a, an embodied spirit, a spirit that, that, that has a body. So I, I'm not going to pretend to know a whole lot about Arabic, but I have read Arabic scholars that make that point. And there's plenty of evidence, uh, evidence you know that uh, up to the ceiling, uh, that Allah was an embodied being. Mm -hmm. so, so here you have uh, a statement after statement associating Mary... Uh, with the other persons of the Godhead, at least the first and second persons, and being identified as the third. And uh, supposedly this is refuting the Christian doctrine. It's not, it's not uh, you know, here Jesus is being asked about this, right? So it, it's, it's not refuting a doctrine of some weird sect. And even if it is, we don't know of such a sect, right? Um, and uh, so Allah seems to be thinking that the Trinity is belief in uh, three three deities, and this is clearly an error. And so once again, Muslims who are watching, either Allah is ignorant of what Christians claim, in which case he's not all knowing, contrary to the Quran, or he does know and he's lying about what Christians believe and Christians claim, in which case he's deceptive. Again, you have you have to pick one because he he's clearly he's clear what he says about what Christians believe, and not just Christians, by the way. But he, he gets he gets wrong what Jews believe, because Sir, Sir nine verse thirty says that that uh, that the Jews say Ezra is the son of God. Show me show me Jews calling Ezra the son of God, and it's supposedly in a way pa that parallels Christians calling Jesus the son of God. So so show us where that happens. So Allah gets Christianity wrong. He gets Judaism wrong. He either doesn't know what we believe, he's stupid, or he's a liar. Which one are you going with? I'm guessing you're going to go with liar because, again, this is a God who brags about being the best of deceivers. Um, <clears throat> Medic for Christ here says, Apparently the Arabs translated Aristotle's writings, and there are stark similarities between the Aristotelian concept of God and Allah. Do you think there is a serious association? There is, there's a clear association with later Islamic philosophers, right? So eventually, basically what you have is Islam goes out and conquers, starts conquering people, right? And as it conquers, it starts getting the books and things that they preserve. And <clears throat> the view was that, you know, there's these are viewed with some suspicion because, hey, maybe these will contradict the Quran or something like that, in which case we have to, we have to get rid of them. Um, but there was also the question of, hey, maybe there's something in here that's helpful. So the philosophers would basically say, if you're talking about philo philosophical works, it would be, hey, we, we, have, we, we have found these works of Aristotle. We would like to see if there is good knowledge in them. And so they could get permission to go through these books. And for a short period of time, philosophy could flourish in the Muslim world. But Islam, as it always does, just completely chokes the life out of any sort of um, uh, philosophical pursuits. And that's why you have these things springing up for a short time, right? Science, science, um, not in the sense, not in the sense of like the scientific revolution that we had in Europe, but in the sense of, you know, trying to build things and engineering and so on that took off for a while in, in the Muslim world. Um, but Islam always just chokes the life out of these kinds of, uh, these kinds of endeavors. And so I, I would say this, if you're talking about the Muslim sources, the God that is presented in the Muslim sources, uh, no, I don't think that's similar to Aristotle, the, 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 the Aristotle's prime mover. 
Um, it's more, it sounds more like a genie to me, right? It sounds like a combination. It sounds like, it sounds like Muhammad basically took Arab views of, of their gods and, and jinn and so on and combined it with something like what the monotheism of, of Judaism and Christianity. And if you ball that together, like a, it sounds like a lot. Like a right? Mr. Potato Head. <clears throat> yeah. You got the lips. I'm making you... a video about that. That's a video right there. <laughs> got the lips. That... <laughs> that's, a, that's a video. Oh, I'm making a video. Mr. Potato God. <laughs> oh, see, I get this is how I get it. This is how I get ideas, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, then he does them better than I even thought of to begin yeah. with. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I would say, yeah, you basically take uh, some elements from Christianity and Judaism, combine them with the the pagan views of of their gods, roll those things up into a ball. You get Allah as Allah is revealed in the Muslim sources. But but if you then take that and then combine it with some ideas of, of Greek philosophers that the Muslims eventually ran into, uh, then you get uh, certain strands of Islamic theology, which which you get do sound, do sound uh, somewhat like um, the God of Aristotle. All right. Should we uh, what do we got here? Nine sixteen. All right. Maybe we'll go another 10 or 15 minutes. Wait, wait, wait. I saw a Trinity stuff up there. What? I saw a Trinity thing up there. Maybe it wasn't relevant. I'm way past it now. I'm way past it. I'm still getting I'm still getting warnings from this guy. <laughs> David Wood, do not say something about your Lord, which you have no knowledge of. Allah is the creator. Allah Akbar. What have I said? <laughs> what have I said about Allah that I don't know? We said that he, he's got the doctrine of the Trinity wrong. He does. That's a fact. We said that he he, uh, he sent Muhammad, who's obsessed with you know bodily functions and bodily fluids and things like that. Uh, he is. So tell us what we're getting wrong here. We'll be happy to be happy to correct. It. Are you aware of anything? I'm we're, we're getting wrong here. No. Uh, and I notice this. You know, when I look at the comments, this is par for the course. I know, but uh, it, it's worth saying still, even though it it just happens all the time. And there's probably nothing that's going to ever stop it. People think that they refute us when they when they come on and make comments and say you're wrong, you're lying, you're this or that. Why not give at least something for us to sink our teeth into? Why not at least say you're wrong about this? Here's a reason why, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he's he's typed out all these words. Why couldn't he add that? Uh, David Wood, don't say something about your Lord. Why not give an example? Uh, why not uh, clearly refute you? I mean, you're, we're willing to put things on the screen. Uh, other people at least are going to see them in the comments section. Why not do something other than just assert it right i mean what's the what was that uh, was it tombstone <laughs> who was it that uh, right. uh one guy slaps the other and says what are you gonna do something or just stand there and bleed stand there and bleed yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean uh, yeah your... that was uh that was uh <laughs> that was uh billy bob thornton billy bob thornton yeah getting slapped by uh <laughs> getting slapped by the man there um <laughs> that's what i always wanted to do to billy bob thornton um hey check this one out here we go. This has to be a troll. This absolutely has to be a troll here. Oh, how dumb are you, Christians? <laughs> Muhammad is in John 16, 7. Uh, I'm assuming this is a troll who just wanted us to uh, to bring this up because it's funny. But um, let's go, go ahead and pull up John 16, 7. Because it is so common, it actually, uh, actually is an important point to bring up because everyone uses this, right? Um, Zakir Naik uses this. Shabir Ali uses this. Everyone uses this. All right, so go ahead and give us John chapter 16, verse 7, quoted by Shabir Ali, okay. quoted by Zakir Naik, and they miss the obvious implication of the verse. All right, 16, 7, Jesus, of course, speaking, says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Mm -hmm. Rewind that again. I mean, go, ahead and, go ahead and hit that again. I tell you and the then, truth. And then and then we'll we'll stop on the relevant part. Go ahead. Okay. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. So this is Jesus. That I go away. He's going is to your advantage that he goes away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The helper. And who who who, who does he identify as the helper? Uh he repeatedly, in the context, identifies the spirit as the helper. In mm -hmm. verse 13, he says, When he, the spirit of truth, mm -hmm. comes, he'll guide you into all the truth. Uh, for mm -hmm. he'll not speak on his own initiative and so forth. Mm -hmm. So the one who's going to do this in the apostles for the apostles that Jesus was otherwise doing for them while he was on earth uh, is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, 
unless Muhammad's a spirit, which which doesn't mean unless Muhammad has a spirit, mm -hmm. right? That's not how the language is being used here. Unless Muhammad is a spirit, meaning he's disembodied, he has no no flesh, he's incorporeal, uh, then he's not the one Jesus is speaking to. And and, and besides that, there's there's also the fact that the, the the backdrop of this, I mean, this is Jesus. He's a first century Jew, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from from the Jewish perspective, the spirit. Is is the is the spirit of God, the one who is brooding over the surface of the waters uh, at the initial creation, right? He's he's brooding over the surface of the deep. The spirit is obviously a pre-existent person. The spirit is somebody who is to be seen on the creator side of the creator-creature distinction, right? The create the, the spirit is not something God made. The spirit is there superintending creation at the time when God made it. So when Jesus in John 16, 7 says, I'm going to send you the Spirit after I go back to the Father, mm -hmm. this he's obviously talking about a person whose point of departure is heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I, uh, again, I mean, you have to have Muhammad being a spirit and and uh, being a, a pre-temporal or heavenly being uh, before he comes to earth. And it mm -hmm. starts to sound a lot like they're deifying Muhammad mm -hmm. once, once you start going down that route. Yeah, right? you'd have to. You'd have to. All mm -hmm. right. So, uh, so yeah, Ron Bus, um, he, he, he admitted in the comments that he was just uh, a troll. He Jesus was just, playing. he was just massive with us. But guys, this is really important because all of Islam's top apologists use this verse and say that the helper, the comforter is Muhammad. But uh, look at who sends the comforter here. Look at who sends the helper. Jesus says, Jesus said, if I go, I will send him to you according to it. So this, this is the point you want to make guys, because again, if you're in a conversation with Muslim, um, and he's, you know, learned why he's supposed to believe that, that Islam is true. He's probably watched like some Zakir Nike videos. And one of the things they love to go to, they either love to go to Deuteronomy 18, either verse 15 or verse 18, which talks about the prophet to come after Moses. Or if they're going to the New Testament, they go right here. They go to the Gospel of John, John 14, 16 and John 16, 7. And they claim that the helper, the comforter is Muhammad. And so if you know ahead of time, if you know ahead of time that the Muslim is going to be bringing this up, then you can be you could be prepared for it and just have him read chapter 16, verse 7, where Jesus is the one who sends the helper, the comforter. And then you point out to them, hey, according to Islam, who sent Muhammad? And your Muslim friend will say, Allah sent Muhammad. Okay, so Allah sent Muhammad. So here's Allah, and Allah sends Muhammad into the world. So according to Islam, Allah sent Muhammad, right? And your Muslim friend says, yes. And you say, okay. And you're saying that Muhammad is the comforter, right? You're saying that Muhammad is the helper, right? That's what you're saying? Yes. Well, according to 16.7, who sends Muhammad? I mean, who sends the comforter? Who sends the comforter? Jesus sends the comforter. All right, so if Allah sends Muhammad... And Jesus sends the comforter, and you're claiming that Muhammad is the comforter. Who would that make Jesus? And that would make Jesus Allah, right? And so, thank you, my Muslim friend. You say, you say, uh, you just uh, thank you for proving that Jesus is the God of Muhammad. And what's cool is that you can go into a lot more detail there, right? Because if you go back to chapter 14, it's Father and Son together who send the comforter, the helper, and. This is the Holy Spirit. He's identified as the Holy Spirit. So notice, this is a Trinitarian passage. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, together sending the Holy Spirit. And so uh, like, like our friend Sam, he even goes a step further and he says, he uses this to prove that the Quran has been corrupted based on Muslims hmm. affirming this passage. And he says, okay. So, and so all kinds of fun things you can do with this. All right, we got about five more minutes here. Then we're going to wrap up. Uh, here's one from Amr. Amr says, hi, David and Anthony, would you use and explain the real meaning of the Arabic term Tawheed to a Muslim? Is it a good way to prove the concept of the Trinity from a linguistic point of view, though I don't agree with using it from a theological perspective? Well, I wouldn't use the term Tawheed to try and prove the doctrine of the Trinity. I guess I, I assume the point he's, he's, he's going after here is um, the word Tawheed means unification, and it comes from a word meaning to unify, right? So notice, you, if you're unifying, if you're unifying things, that sounds like you're you're putting things together, right? You're putting multiple things together and unifying them. Well, that's a pretty strange thing. If you're if you're if your obsession in Islam is with this absolute oneness, and the word that you use to describe your theology is a bunch of things coming together as one, 
um, you could you could you could point that out as as a concern or problem. I wouldn't use that to to prove the doctrine of the Trinity because I don't believe that it is that that is a proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. We know that that God is a Trinity because God has revealed Himself as a Trinity. Um, but I would point it out as a problem for Muslim claims, for Muslim claims that they're making. Um, and, and, and by itself, I, I wouldn't use it, but I would use that in a conjunction of a lot of other things. So some of the other things that are involved here, and again, we're, we're, we're going to wrap this up. Um, but in Islam, you have not only Allah, but you have the spirit of Allah, right? Mm -hmm. You've got the spirit of Allah. And, and when Allah creates, according to the Quran, he just says, be, and it is. But... The spirit Allah actually breathes out from within himself. Right? The spirit Allah breathes out. And according to Islamic theology, anything originating from within Allah is Allah. Right. So this isn't something that he just says, he just speaks, and it is. In fact, it's the spirit, it's the spirit by which he creates, right? So the spirit is in a completely different category from all created things. The spirit originates from within Allah. And you'd have to say so eternally, otherwise this would be a change in Allah. Um, so you have that. You also have... Allah's eternal speech, the Quran, which Muslims also believe is eternal. So notice, you've already got three eternal things. And notice what they are, by the way. You've got Allah, the Spirit, and the Word. Hmm. Allah, the Spirit, and the Word. And they all have divine attributes. Um, we've pointed out, uh, I've pointed out before, Islam sounds like it's, like it's a parody of Christianity that just gets a bunch of things wrong. Like it's trying to imitate Christianity, but just ends up getting a bunch of things wrong. Um, and, and so what, it, you just have this massive difference between Christian theologians and Muslim theologians in that Christian theologians recognize, wait a minute, you've got the father in the Bible and the father is God, but you also have the son and the son is God. And you also have the Holy Spirit and the, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there's only one God. How do we make sense of this? Well, you need something like the doctrine of the Trinity. In Islam, it's no, just complete, complete, un complete unity, complete unification, um, absolute oneness. You say, what do you do with this eternal word of Allah? What do you do with that? It's this eternal, it's this eternal additional thing. It's got an attribute of Allah. What is that? Don't worry about it. Be la kaif. Right? <laughs> right? That's what they say. So um, you've got that. What about the spirit? That is not something that Allah just says be and it is. It's something that originates from within Allah. What do you do with that? The spirit, the spirit can act in Islam, in the Quran, the spirit actually takes on the form of a person. The, 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 the spirit appears in human form to speak to Mary. The spirit takes on a form. Um, so the spirit is conscious. The spirit is a conscious person originating from without, from within Allah, from all eternity. <laughs> what are you doing with this, right? They just ignore this and say, we, we, we don't know. Well, Christian theologians actually try to wrestle with these issues and try to come up with a doctrine that actually fits Muslims cling to the part of their theology that they like, and then the, the revelations make no sense. So that's just that. There are all kinds of other things you can point out, like the doctrine, the, like the Quran. The Quran appears in human form. The Quran a, a pale, appears as a pale man, conscious, to talk to people. Um, but the Quran, but according to the Quran, I mean, according to Muhammad, the individual chapters of the Quran are individual consciousnesses, right? They appear as flocks of birds to tell people what they've done and to, to testify at the judgment and things like that. So notice you've got 114 individual chapters of the Quran. That's 114 separate uh, flocks of birds that appear and know what you've been doing and can testify on your behalf. That's 114 separate persons who are somehow all together in one Quran that can appear as one being, right? My Muslim friends, if you think the doctrine of the Trinity is confusing, you need to read your sources because your sources are filled with things that are far, far, far more confusing. The only difference is Christians, we, re we read our books and our theologians try to wrestle with these issues. Your theologians try to keep these things hidden from you. That's why you Muslims have never heard of these things before you heard them from us. Your leaders don't tell you about them. Your leaders don't talk about them. They don't want you to be confused by the words of your prophet. How can... <laughs> What kind of religion tries to keep people insulated and in the dark from the words they, of their prophet? You, you, you know, it'd be great if they, <laughs> if they, if in keeping them from what their prophet said, they weren't masking it with other errors, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, fine. Well, you know, Muhammad taught all these crazy things. If you want to pretend that he taught the truth, then that'd be great. I mean, I, I it's not ideal, but it's better than, uh, you know, teaching other falsehood. Now, they... They don't uh, as quickly uh, 
change what Muhammad taught about some other things. It'd be nice if they did. Right. Like like uh, the propriety or the right of marrying little girls. Jihad. Uh, right. Why not twist those things? <laughs> you know, why not? I know they do sometimes when they're trying to engage in apologetics. Mm -hmm. Right. But they don't when it comes to the dirty deed. Right. Yeah. Muslims still promote this sort of thing in their country. So, uh, yeah, I wish so, they could select better. So let's keep all the jihad, keep all the perverted sex stuff, keep all the stuff about um, sucking fingers and going to the bathroom in certain ways. But we'll keep everyone in the dark. <laughs> about what our prophet said about <laughs> what he really said about God and the spirit and the word and the Quran and the individual chapters of the Quran, you know, each having their own consciousnesses and so on and, and combining into one. Let's just keep them in the dark about that because if because then we'll lose our advantage. If, if we tell Muslims what Muhammad actually said, they'll be totally confused. They'll be totally horrified and they'll leave Islam. We don't want them doing that. So we'll just keep them in the dark. But there's a penalty there, ladies and gentlemen, because then people like us are going to come along and tell Muslims what's in your sources. And then Muslims are going to start thinking to themselves, wait a minute, these guys are quoting my prophet. My leaders don't do that. My leaders don't tell, didn't tell us these things. Why did our leaders keep these things hidden from us? If they kept us in the dark about these things, what else have they kept us in the dark about? And then if that confidence in their leader starts to break down, guess what? As Bilal Phillips has put it, avalanche of apostasy. An avalanche mm. of apostasy. It's building, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. All right. We wrapping it up? We are. I think it's a good <clears throat> note to end on. All right, guys. Um, I will be... I need a screenshot of that, by the way. What? Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, yep, Anthony and I will be recording. Um, I will be out of town for a couple days. If you're in Kentucky, I'll be speaking at a, a conference in uh, Louisville on Saturday. If you got that, I'll probably post an announcement about that. Um, apart from that, yeah, uh, I saw someone earlier asked about Sam, when Sam's going to be back on. Um, me and not this coming week, this, this, this coming week, I'll be recording shows with uh, vocab. We'll be recording our, our series about Muhammad's interviews with Socrates and, and others. And uh, after that, I'll be with Al Fadi and Sam Shamoon. We'll be recording uh, more videos for Al Fadi's channel. Uh, we'll probably go. I'll, I'll try to go live while we're down there. Um, while we're all while we're all together, probably go live. And uh, part and after that, Sam's coming here with me and should be here for a little while. So we'll probably be going live every night uh starting i guess two weeks or so from now yep so two weeks or so from now sam shimon and i should be both be here going live every night for a while so uh hope you all looking forward to that and see you next time i don't know when but you'll see me again and him too <laughs> sometime